countryside. So let's all give it up for Goat Ball, y'all. All right. Thank you, Gwen. That was very kind. All right. Oh, wow, this is bright. Um, okay, how was lunch? Good? Okay, is everyone awake? Still? Okay, with me. All right. Um, so, my name is Gopal. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, my evaluation of where uh, server side Swift is today. Um, and hopefully, uh, I give you an impression of uh, the way I see things as well. All right. So let's get started. Uh, motivation for this talk. Um, so a few months ago, uh, we were going to be starting uh, a new project, uh, and we had to pick a server-side uh, language and framework for it. Um, and I had to decide on this thing. And uh, you know what I said was, OK, my focus, my team's focus is going to be on the product. We don't want to be fighting the tools. We don't want to be fighting the frameworks and that sort of thing. But at the same time, we said, OK, well, we're used to writing stuff in Java and Python. Let's take a look at Swift uh, and see where things are, right? So that's sort of where this is going on. So as I was walking around the halls today and talking to people, and everyone just kept asking me, so is it there yet? Um, and I would have really, really liked to put on, you know, Craig style slamming down yes or no, but rather uncontroversially, the answer is it depends. <laughs> Right? Uh, OK. All right, so let me set some goals for this talk uh, before uh, we get too far into it. So first, um, quick show of hands. How many of you here are uh, client side, that is iOS, web, Android, i.e. not server side developers? OK, I can't really see completely, but everyone in the front seems to be. So I'm going to take that as representative of the back as well. <laughs> uh, of, or of, the, of those of you who are doing this now, how many of you have done server side development in other life? OK, not as many. OK, so my hope is to sort of uh, point out a few things that one thinks about when building a server-side app, right? Some of these are obvious. Some of them are less so. Next, um, I'm going to sort of point out uh, some of the things that make Swift, the language itself, uh, a great fit for building server-side applications. Um, after that, I'm kind of hoping to provide you an unbiased opinion of what the way I see things uh, and hopefully help you decide whether Swift is viable for you. Uh, just a quick caveat, I am not affiliated with any of the Swift frameworks or any other framework in any other language. I've never been a contributor. I'm not proud of it, but that's the truth. Uh, so hopefully I can give you an unbiased opinion, right? Um, all right. Uh, and as well, I'm kind of hoping to provide a little bit of constructive criticism. The idea is to hopefully point out the missing pieces so, hey, either some of you can go fix them or at least you're aware of what those are, okay? Uh, finally, the reason you choose a language or a framework is often not technical, right? Uh, for instance, uh, if you have a team of people who have been writing Ruby on Rails for the last 10 years, you're probably not going to look too far beyond that. Uh, similarly, if you're looking to grow rapidly, Swift is probably not the area where you can hire people with experience uh, on the server side anyway. So I'm going to completely ignore all of those and focus purely on the technical stuff, uh, so just keep that in mind. Okay. With that, uh, stuff to consider when you're building a server-side app. So the number one question that comes to my mind anyway is where am I going to store my data, right? Uh, and usually, the answer to that is some form of relational database, right? So your Postgres, MySQL, uh, whatever. Uh, once you've decided on that, let's say you have decided on that, the next question you ask is, uh, what level of abstraction am I going to use to talk to this database? So for instance, uh, a lot of people use ORMs. How many of you are familiar with what an ORM is? Most of you. OK, I hate them. <laughs> uh, so what I generally do is I go one level lower, and I use a library that gives me something that looks a lot like SQL, but is still in the language of choice that I'm using. right? Um, but sometimes people just write raw SQL as well. right? So you need to know what level you're going to talk to your database at. And you need to know whether your framework supports that well or poorly. Next, uh, how many of you, quick show of hands again, have handled a core data migration? OK, then you know what this is about, right? This is just even more painful on the server because you no longer have the option of saying, well, if I screw it up, I can just delete everything and start over. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but this is really important, A, because of scale, and B, again, this is your canonical store, so you can't mess it up. Right? So you need to think about this ahead of time. 
Uh, these days, a lot of people go away from relational databases and go with document stores like MongoDB or whatever. If you really like deleting your data, go for it. <laughs> um, or you may want to use a columnar store like Cassandra. And again, if you're doing something like Cassandra, you need to have a lot of operational expertise, so think about it ahead of time. Okay? Next, uh, load profile. And what I mean by this is what kind of load is your application likely to get? So, for example, you could have a large number of you know, quick requests. So this is your typical web API where you're getting a whole number of requests. You're going to probably respond to them in under 50 milliseconds or so unless your web service is terrible. Um, or you could have, for instance, a large number of open connections with relatively low activity. So this is typically some sort of push-based type of system where if you're old school and you're building an IMAP server, this is what happens there. Or if you're doing something with web sockets and building a better Slack, that could happen too. Right? Uh, a third thing that is not as common but we run into quite a lot is you have a small number of requests, but they're all really heavy. And this is usually around something like reporting where you may have to go and fetch data from a number of sources, crunch them, and, and put it back out. Right? And each of these things can really impact what sort of framework and what sort of things you're looking for in a server-side application. Another thing that I, th I see a lot of people completely miss, at least when they start, is setting expectations of what your web service is supposed to do. So I like to call this, and everybody does, I suppose, SLAs, so service level agreements. So what are SLAs? Things like, I'm going to handle X requests per second on one unit of deployment. So let's say I run on some sort of AWS server. I'm going to say, for one instance of this, I'm going to handle so many requests per second, and that's my goal. Why you do this is then you know whether you're succeeding or failing, and you can correspondingly adjust, right? Uh, another one that a lot of people set is a 90th percentile response time, or maybe even a 99th percentile response time if you're really concerned about your long tail, right? Uh, next, deployment. How messy is it to deploy your application? If you ever hear someone who's saying it's easy to deploy something, they're lying, <laughs> right? Don't believe them. It's, it's just a question of how bad is it. It's never going to be easy, right? Um, and of course, a lot of people keep today saying, you know, Docker will fix that, but it's not going to fix it, right? Why? Because more moving pieces is more things that can go sideways. So if, you're, if you do something, say, in the Python ecosystem, you've got seven different things that need to line up just the right way, or you're either going to have performance problems or something's not going to work, right? So the simpler you can make it, the better off you are. And this is really an area where things like Swift shine because really it's one fat binary that has hardly any runtime dependencies, right? Next, uh, another important one that a lot of people miss is how am I going to debug in production, right? So it's easy when you're running locally, but you're going to see problems that happen in production that you can't reproduce locally, A, because you don't have your users' data or their traffic coming through, or for various number of reasons, right? So you need to have an answer to how am I going to do this. And typically, the answer is some sort of logging or monitoring. Second, uh, you don't want your users to pick up the phone or something and call you and say, hey, your web service is down, right? You need to know ahead of time, as things start to approach wrong, you're already aware that they're wrong, right? Uh, and typically, the way you do this is you're going to monitor some metrics. So you need to know, what is it that I'm going to monitor? Some of this may be sort of user-facing in the sense of, again, you're measuring the response time and stuff like that. Or it could be something internal, like the number of database connections I have, the number of open threads I have, and so on. Okay? So with that, um, what Swift frameworks that I consider? So I sort of experimented with Kitura and Vapor. I know there's a bunch of them out there, but these two seem to be the most popular, so these are the ones I went with. Uh, so with that, let's sort of get into uh, what I think Swift is really good at for server-side development. The number one thing in my book is Swift is not garbage collected, right? And you talk to people and they say, you know what, garbage collection is not a problem on the server. I don't have frame drops as an issue. I don't have my 16 millisecond problem, except it's a problem until it isn't. Right? Um, at some point, you're going to have to deal with this. Um, and why is it a problem? A, so again, this is in the context of Java. You're always going to have to have a whole bunch of memory allocated for quote unquote free in the sense of you're not actually going to use it, but without it, you're not going to be able to run in a performant way. So typically, if your Java app needs about a gigabyte, you're going to want to give it two just to keep it running smoothly. Right? Second, uh, pause the world is still a problem, right? So if you look at your long tail response times, uh, you're going to often see that one re response just took four seconds, 
for no explicable reason. And the reason is often garbage collection, right? Um, but with Arc, which is what Swift uses, is it's low overhead, which means that you know, you're not gonna have the pause the world issue. And more importantly, it's predictable, which means you can actually try and reproduce your problems instead of in a garbage collected environment where you kind of just hope it happens and you happen to be monitoring at that time, right? Next, uh, value types. So concurrency on a server is of paramount importance, right? Obviously it's important on the client as well, but it's even more important on the server and it's even more important you don't make a mistake because that could mean you're giving one user's data to another user, right? Which will probably lead to you shutting down. Or hopefully it will anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we all know this, right? This is not a secret. Shared mutable state is evil. We all hate it. And what a lot of server-side languages generally do is they remove the mutable part and make it shared immutable state. So you end up having to copy stuff all over, all over the place, which by and large works, right? But the problem is the most interesting thing you do with data is mutate it, right? And this is where value types are fantastic because they remove the shared part and give you the mutable part and they also allow you to sort of get the performance optimizations of not having to make copies when you don't actually need them. Right? Next, performance. Uh, I'll give you a second to look through it, but the general idea behind this test is it makes a whole bunch of HTTP requests uh, that to a particular server, and the server serializes an object to JSON and gives it back to you. I know it's not a meaningful test, but you can already see that the latency, and this is really the number you're after, this is what your users will see, is already significantly lower uh, in Swift compared to a popular Java framework and compared to especially a popular Python framework. Now, is this best in class? No, C++ and Rust still beat it handily, but those are much harder to write and Swift is far more productive. In terms of your throughput, if you look at the responses for sec per second, it's not quite there, but it's pretty close, right? Um, Let's move on to a slightly more realistic test. So this one makes a request, the request goes to a database, queries an object, converts that object back into JSON and kicks it back out. So much more representative of a typical web API. Um, and again, you'll see that the latency is lower in Swift than elsewhere. And again, is it best in class? No, again, C++ and Rust tend to beat it, but it's pretty close, right? Um, and if you look at throughput, again, there's a little bit more of a drop off here, but uh, for what it's worth, these numbers are with Kitora 2, and Kitora 2.5 came out a couple of days ago, and I didn't have time to test it, so it's probably gotten better, right? Next, uh, memory footprint. So this is, again, an area where Swift really shines. Uh, so this is under the exact same load as the previous uh, database test, the peak memory usage of this application. So you're looking at about 800 megabytes, right? Um, Python is relatively close, but Java is way up there, right? So you have to sort of use more memory in Java to get the same result, okay? And again, keep in mind, this is peak, not average. At the lowest, this was actually about 150 megabytes, okay? All right, uh, CPU usage. So this is a bit of a controversial one in some sense because really you want your apps to use more CPU so they're not lying around idle, but under the same workload, a lower CPU usage is good because it means you have more overhead to do more stuff. So again, Swift is not quite there yet, but very, very close, right? Okay, all right, on to the fun stuff. This is me complaining. <laughs> okay, all right, the biggest problem, dealing with errors. So let's say you have an app in Java or Python or Ruby and uh, you commit the cardinal sin for a programmer, you make a mistake, right? I've never done that before, <laughs> okay? Totally honest here. <laughs> Um, so let's say you do that and you have something like a null pointer exception or let's say for instance uh, you initialize an enum from a string value but the string value is not one of the correct ones and you end up you know, effectively crashing. What happens? Okay, you kill that request, you return a 500 to your client, end of story, right? Most importantly, none of your other in-flight requests are affected in any way, right? So if you have a thousand requests going through a process, this one dies in a predictable way but the others go just fine. This is unfortunately not the case in Swift because a single bang can literally kill your process and will kill your process. You will not get a 500 response back, not just for the bad request, but for every other open connection you have as well, right? Now, yes, in theory, your client should retry and all of that stuff, 
but this is still a pretty big problem. Now, of course, the whole point of Swift is to avoid things like null pointer exceptions. But it does mean you have to be careful in how you use it, and it's not going to be the same way you write your iOS apps, right? If you've written iOS in Swift, I mean, everybody uses bangs all over the place, right? Um, so you can't do that here. And it also means that pretty much every function you write is going to become a throwing function, right? So it's something to keep in mind. Next, this is one of the most unhelpful things I've seen. So let's say I do make a mistake, right? And th this is what happens. That's all you get. Right? I have no idea why that happened. Right? Uh, so, and again, I don't mean to pick on Vapor. This happens with all of them. Uh, this just happens to fit nicely in a screenshot. <laughs> um, but the idea is here that uh, you get this score dump, and then it's on you to go and figure out exactly what happened here. Whereas if you have something in Java or Python, you get helpful symbolicated stack traces and all of that stuff right off the bat. So it's really easy to debug. Right? Next, concurrency. So, Everybody knows Swift's concurrency model is sort of not really there yet. Uh, there's been a lot of interesting proposals. I don't really have anything interesting to add here, except for it would be nice for this to get settled quickly. <laughs> right? OK. Now with the frameworks. First, uh, there isn't really a standard way to do logging uh, in Swift on the server side. And the way this works on clients and servers is fundamentally different uh, because you actually want, this is your primary way of debugging issues, right? So if you look in the Java ecosystem, uh, there's something called SLF for J, which is sort of an interface that a lot of libraries log with. And then I can choose what implementation I want to hook into it for my app and get, get it to go to different places. It also does things like structured logging, where I can get computer possible uh, log messages without going through too much hell. Uh, Python has its own thing for this in struct log and logging. Um, and pretty much, again, Ruby, you, you pick it, it likely has an answer for this already. Of course, framework specific logging exists. So Kutura has its own logger, Vapor has its own, the others have their own too. But unfortunately, they're not really super versatile at the moment. And what do I mean by that? A, uh, they don't have this concept of structured logging or MDC or TLC. Show of hands, how many of you know what that means? Exactly what I thought. When I first saw this, I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> I will get to it. <laughs> uh, next, it only logs to say SCD out, for instance. So it doesn't do rollover of old log files and stuff like that. And again, in theory, you can sort of redirect your STD out of file and have Unix roll it over for you. But ideally, I'd just like it to work, right? Um, it al it's also missing sort of uh, common monitoring tools like the Skoda Hale metrics thing, which a lot of server side people use, where if not use it directly, the idea behind it of having counters and gauges and that sort of thing uh, is common. And then you can build tools that ingest all this data and do interesting things with that. I believe IBM has a version of this up and coming soon, or it's already there, but uh, hasn't worked. It hasn't, said it hasn't become a standard the way, like, say, Skoda Hale's metrics has. OK, on to MDC. So MDC stands for Mapped Diagnostic Context. Again, when I read that, I was like, I understand these words. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with it. So the idea is, uh, once you get used to it, is it's, it's a way of building up a context as you go. right? So you have sort of, say, a protocol that says, I can put a key value pair, I can get a, key, uh, get a value for a key, and clear it, and so on. So how do you use it? So let's say you have uh, something like this, which is a root handler for your request, where all your requests go through this function. I may say, OK, if my request has a user agent, I'm going to pull that out and put it into this context. right? Next, let's say I go through an authenticate handler. So again, I may look for the authentication header and say, OK, I'm going to get a user ID from that header and put that into my context. Finally, let's say I'm actually going to log something, like I sent an email. I just say logger.info and, and the message. Ultimately, what does this look like? So I pulled this example from one of our uh, actual JVM apps. So I don't intend for you to read all of this stuff. It's, it's mostly meaningless. But the idea is you have a structured log message that you can write tools to parse this without a human being having to read it. And your ultimate thing is just the response sent. That's what you log. But everything comes with all the context that's been built up so far. Right? So if I'm debugging something and say instead of response sent, it said failed to send response, I know which user it was for, I know what the request ID was for so I can trace it through my system, I know what the user agent is, and all a bunch, whatever I want really. Right? So I get all this context around it, and there's really no good way to do this in Swift today. 
Next, uh, code sharing. So presumably, the reason you write server-side Swift is you want to share your code with iOS, right? Makes sense, except it doesn't. <laughs> so in reality, you're not going to be sharing much of anything, right? And here's why. Um, the database libraries are wildly different, right? So on iOS, heaven forbid you use something like core data or something better even, it's wildly different from what you use on the server side. So you're not going to be sharing your model objects or anything like that really. Next, your networking libraries are also different because on the server side, you're using something based on Neo and on the client side, you're using URL session. But wait for the next talk. All right, uh, and usually your business logic is sort of intricately tied to both of these things. Without these things, you're gonna have a hard time to write anything. Of course, if you do happen to have a pure function that you can share, great, but in my experience, it's really not gonna work too often. All right, so next, missing libraries. So how many of you have had to do this? Show of hands. One person? Okay, you guys have it way better than I do. <laughs> um, so for me, this is a royal pain. Right? I do not want to be an expert at writing Microsoft Office files. Right? Nobody grew up dreaming, I'm gonna write Microsoft Office files. <laughs> right? But it is a thing you have to do. Right? And this is something we do quite a bit of. And there's no real good library for this on Swift. And the idea I'm trying to point out here is not that, oh, you can't write Microsoft Office files. The idea is because of lack of, you know, the ecosystem hasn't been around as long, you're gonna have these gaps in your libraries, right? So if you were looking at Java or Python, there's about 100 different ways you can do this. Another example of this is if you wanna resize images or burn in your JPEG rotation or whatever it is, there isn't a great Swift library to do that yet, right? Um, obviously, you can bind to a C library and you know, get away with it to an extent, but that's work you're doing, which really, it's not your core competence, right? Okay, tooling. Xcode is pretty good, yeah? Everybody likes it? Nobody likes Xcode? <laughs> okay, raise your hands, I know it's been lunch. Do you like Xcode? Okay, great. How many of you like Swift PM? Okay, someone said, what's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Swift PM is like CocoaPods, but for Swift. <laughs> uh, and, and better as well in some ways. <laughs> um, unfortunately, <laughs> Xcode combined with Swift PM is going to leave you crying. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to debug on Linux. Why? Because a lot of stuff is different on Mac OS and Linux. Foundation itself is completely different. So. I cannot remember the number of times where something works perfectly fine when I run on my Mac, and then I put it on Linux, and you see that core dump, right? So you really need to constantly keep debugging on Linux, and the problem is there's no good way to do this, right? You're gonna have to do something funny where you set up uh, Docker setup and stuff like that and run it through the command line and you can't attach your debugger really and stuff like that. Um, you can sort of hack Xcode to do this in a funny way, but the problem is you then end up throwing your Xcode project away because you're supposed to generate them with Swift PM. So every time we do it, you have to redo all this stuff. So it's really not a great experience. Uh, finally, and this is not super important to everybody, but the problem is Apple only provides binaries for Swift on Ubuntu. And guess what a lot of enterprises use? Anyone? Red Hat. Right? So if, if, you are a, if you're in a situation where Red Hat is what you have to use, you can't just use the Apple binaries, right? You're gonna have to make your own or, or run on Ubuntu or whatever. Okay, with that, a uh, quick summary. Um, we talked about uh, some of the things you consider when you build a server-side app. Uh, we went through some of the things that Swift is really good at, which is there's no garbage collection, uh, value types are pretty awesome, uh, performance is already pretty good and it's only gonna get better uh, finally, resource usage, again, is already pretty good, but it's only gonna get better. Finally, we went through some areas where Swift could be better, and hopefully, uh, I've pointed out a few pit holes that you, know, you can sort of avoid if, 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 you, if you'd like to. So with that, uh, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, thank you to Natasha and all the other conference organizers for giving me the opportunity to come speak here. I'm over at the office hours if you wanna come find me for some more, uh, uh, you know, less polite, our takes on this. <laughs> Thank you.